Ladies and gentlemen of Ace Comic Con, please welcome the trickster guy, Tom Hiddleston! Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, hope you've had a nice weekend. I certainly have. Um, and a slightly um, unusual thing we have for you this afternoon is um, I'm going to be asking the questions. Um, sort of leisurely Sunday afternoon fireside chat. Um, and my fireside chat companion is uh, an actor I've worked with before, uh, but never, even though we share a place in the Marvel Universe, in the Marvel Universe. Uh, you've, some of you have probably taken your picture with her already. Uh, she's been in so many movies you love, including the Marvel ones. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Olsen, Wanda Maximoff. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Whoa, we got a lot of Loki horns in the audience. Hats off to everybody. The, some of the cosplayers this weekend have been extraordinary, um, including the woman who came uh, as in a costume dressed like this. Uh, Literally? Someone dressed like you? Blue in jumper, Haiti? blue jeans, gray boots, glasses. That's hilarious. It's kind of amazing. That's also, incredible. I would, there was a bear dressed like this. Um, all kinds of things. Anyway, listen. That's very cool. I got to do my job now. Hi, Lizzie. Hi, Tom. <laughs> so, uh, we made a film together. Um, we, sh we, we shot it, um, well, how long ago now? Four years ago. Almost, almost exactly to the day. Yeah, because it was fall. Yeah, um, in the autumn of 2014 called I Saw the Light. And, yes. We got to work in Shreveport, Louisiana. Yep. Anyone from Louisiana? Cool, cool, three. That's great, that's great. <laughs> and we had a great time working with each other. Yeah, and great. I had just finished doing Age of Ultron and was about to do Civil War. Yeah, yeah. And I was asking you all about your experience for the last five years playing Loki. Oh. So, this was, I was doing my homework for this chat. And what's amazing is, obviously, we played Hank Williams and Audrey Mae Shepard in I Saw the Light. We played husband and wife. They had a very tempestuous relationship. But Lizzie and I have never uh, actually spent a single day on set of a Marvel movie together. Yep. And you'd think there, are no, there aren't that many points of connection between Loki and Wanda. But I realized... <laughs> what did you realize? I realize this. So, so Loki, correct me if I'm wrong, Loki is indirectly responsible or in some roundabout way for the Powers. initial enhancement of Wanda. That's correct. Because of the scepter. Yes, and the... The Mind Stone. The Mind Stone. The Mind Stone being... The uh, thing that gave me power and yeah. my, um, my, my brother Quicksilver. Too bad. That was sad. That was. <laughs> we lost him too, you guys. <laughs> so, so that basically the scepter which Loki wields in Avengers One, which contains the Mind Stone, and with which Loki um, controls the minds of Eric Selvig and Clint Barton, is the very same Mind Stone that gives. Wanda her power. True. Connection point one. Very cool. Very cool. And my second point was a slightly more uh, 
emotional. psychological one, yeah. yeah. Which is that they're both connected by trauma. Yes. And loss. Yes. That they both feel alone in the universe. Yes. And they both have a brother. Yes. Well, had. Had. <laughs> yeah. I know, again, jeez. <laughs> yeah. um, and I thought that was really interesting. Because uh, in a way, they're both um, sorcerers. Or their, their powers aren't... Um, with lo both Loki and with Wanda, there's no vibranium. There's no uh, iron suit. There's no celestial hammer of any kind. Um, it's, it's powered by a lot of rage and emotion yeah. and sadness, yeah. which we get to do. We but get to have a lot of rage and emotion <laughs> and sadness. But I thought that was really interesting in term, in a, as an acting thing, in that actually these are two people who have very complex minds. And that of all the Infinity Stones, the Infinity Stone that they are interested in is the Mind Stone. That's a great connection, Tom. You know, I, I, was, I was really thinking about this last night. Yeah. Time. Um, I like that. And um, and then and so and then I was thinking of the journey. I kind of did a. Uh, I went back and watched. So your first appearance is, the end of the Winter Soldier. Is that right? Yes, uh, we appeared at the tag scene at the, the twins, end. Yeah. Um, and we were being experimented on by Hydra. By Strucker. By Strucker. That's right. Yes. With the Mind Stone. Yes. I feel like I'm taking an exam. <laughs> <laughs> He's writing a thesis and it's a good one. <laughs> Are these traumatized siblings of different points. Anyway, that's really was my point. I was thinking, how do I connect these two characters apart from the fact that it's Hank and Audrey, but actually they have this, um, you know, here we are at the, we, well, we're at the same place as you are, which is having seen Infinity War and, and these six infinity stones, and actually the, the mind stone is the thing that connects these two. And also a sense of, I think, sacrifice. Because I think the thing you have to do at the end of Infinity War is a kind of sacrifice. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and arguably Loki makes a similar one. Um, yeah. Um, it's only gonna get worse. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what I was wondering process wise um, we made a film and it was about uh, two people in very much in a, a human reality and whenever we were in a scene together we were in the same room in a set that had been built by a production designer and dressed in costumes it all was the, the sense of reality was given to us by the crew and you're making, a film, you're making a Marvel movie, and so much of it is not real. Right. The space you're in, the thing you're looking at, and how do you find that as an actor? I want to ask you that after, but um, sure. for me, I, I, it's a fun game, again, of like being on the playground and getting to be a child and be imaginative, but trying to figure out whatever st stakes those actually could be in your own life yeah. and replacing them in a way. And then I learned at a certain point along the way that squinting your eyes is very powerful regardless of how you actually feel. <laughs> a stunt person told me that. They're like, if you just squint your eyes, it'll look very, very strong. And I was like, okay, I'll just start doing this then. <laughs> so that's also important. Yeah. But what I wanted to ask you, because you created Loki, and in the, in the comics, he is a mischievous character. But when you were starting to create him, what, and I know you're also, by working with you, you're very detailed um, with everything that goes into a character physically and also emotionally. Yeah. Were you thinking at all about what it could become iconically? Or were you leaving that to like costume designers and makeup? Because you became an iconic character within the last 10 years. And I think that's very cool. Honestly, it was the most, like coming at the, 
the character for the first time, uh, I just found him so interesting in that, um, first of all, he's an archetype that's been around for two going on three millennia. I don't know how far back exactly the Norse myths go, but um, the Scandinavian folklore has been around for, you know, for, for as long as almost the Greco-Roman folklore. So Loki is a figure in, in the collective unconscious. Um, Do you mean literally, like in Norse mythology? In Norse mythology. There is something named Loki. Loki, he's a god, and he's the god of mischief. I just thought it was a comic. <laughs> yeah. You learn something new every day. Did you follow up on your Norse mythology? I did. I read some. Yeah. yeah. It, what, what was really interesting for me was reading the Norse myths and, um, and, and, and figuring out who Loki was and Odin and Frigga. Uh, you all probably know the days of the week uh, are named. Some, three days of the week are named. Uh, Thursday is Thor's day. Wed <laughs> Wednesday is Odin's day, and Friday is Frigga's day. You're going to change everyone's calendar right now. Everyone's going <laughs> to go home, and they're going to be like, yeah. I want a Thor-themed calendar. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, lo no Loki day. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> um, but it, so in the Norse myths, actually, there's a really tremendous, and I know I've, some of you have asked me to sign it this weekend. Uh, Neil Gaiman has, done, has written a new... Um, anthology of the Norse myths, and there's lots of stories about, about Loki and Thor, and, and Loki always was somebody in the company of the gods. They didn't trust him, they didn't particularly like him, but they knew he was necessary. And when they were really up against it and they couldn't think of a solution to a problem, a hand would go up from the end of the table and they'd go, okay, Loki, what have you got, what's your plan? And it would be completely out of left field, very um, strange, illogical, irrational, and chaotic, but he would win the day, and Asgard would be preserved. And I thought that was an amazing, the idea that chaos is something that we sometimes need, that we like things to be ordered, and, and actually there's this character that we've invented to exist in our minds who represents chaos and mischief. And then what Stan Lee did, and Jack Kirby, and all the people who've illustrated for Marvel, is they took that sort of kernel, and they and he developed it into his place in the Marvel Universe, which is mischievous, anarchic, um, and uh, initially uh, more two-dimensional. But as the comics go on since the 60s into the 70s, 80s, and especially the 90s and the noughties, um, he's a deeply damaged character. There's so much emotion in it. Um, and also ambiguous. He's... he's not even gendered, really. He can be a man or a woman. Um, I remember you telling yeah. me that. Yeah. There's a lady Loki. There's a kid Loki. There's, yeah. uh, he's, he's pansexual in some, in some extraordinary way. Yeah. Um, so will you be doing any of the <laughs> other Lokis? <laughs> no. I don't. If you, if you, what are you asking exactly? Are you going to do a Loki that's not archetypal male? I think if anyone wants to tell that story, I'm not the guy. Okay, okay. I think, I think uh, that needs to be a woman or right. someone who identifies right. so. as a yes. woman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'd never answered your question. So, Sorry, yes, iconic. Yeah, so, so Kenneth Branagh, when he was asked by Kevin Feige to make the first Thor film, um, and it, and it all kind of, the whole Thor universe, in a way, we owe to uh, Ken Branagh. He, he, what he recognized was obviously the storytelling tradition he grew up in was this dynastic drama, uh, a powerful uh, narrative about kings and princes and fathers and sons. And uh, Kenneth Branagh has done so much Shakespeare. Of course, Shakespeare is the, he was, you know, the, 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 the the best and the first at that kind of thing. And so he decided to make Thor in the mold of those great uh, dynastic plays by Shakespeare, like Henry IV or King Lear or... Which you've played, Henry. I, I played, yeah, Prince Hal and Henry V, yeah. yeah. He's very talented. No, no, come on. He's very, so, very talented. 
So, this, so the first film really is meant to be that the things we drew from the comics were um, the key relationships between brothers and between fathers and sons. Mm -hmm. Because anyone, doesn't matter where you're from, uh, you can relate to being misunderstood within your own family. Yes. And that was really where I, w I thought, well, I'll try and do my best in terms of the shape-shifting and the, um, the magic and the sorcery and the mischief and the kind of chaos, but also to realize that behind all that was a broken heart. Um, and uh, to me, that, oh, that's just a great character. Mm -hmm. And then it was really fun working with Alexandra Byrne, who designed the costumes uh, for the first oh, Thor right. film yeah. and Avengers and, and Ultron. Ultron. Yeah. And she comes from an amazing background in, in um, very theatrical, uh, stylized uh, costumes. She, um, I think, won an Oscar for her costumes for Elizabeth with Kate Blanchett. And so she designed this, this royal family to look like a royal family. But she also knew we had to fight and Chris had to right. be able to move and he had to wield the hammer. Um, and in the comics, he got black hair, so I dyed my hair black and I didn't have a beard then. <laughs> um, and no, and, and he's become something. I mean, I should say, like, I think Loki has become what he's become because of the audience. That, that the only reason he's been around for ten years is because of you guys. So thank you. Did you did you think you were going to be doing this for a decade of your life? Nope. <laughs> I did not. I really didn't. Does it get more fun to you, or um, does it become harder because you feel like the stakes keep needing to meet a different level, or is it the same process each time you go back in the wig? Now wig. Yeah, it's, it's just been such an extraordinary journey um, with so many different chapters. Uh, I, I found that it got easier because I was so overwhelmed yeah. being a, a small piece of this really big, big puzzle. And I wanted to just focus on my piece and I was intimidated by everyone. And, and then eventually I started to feel more comfortable and then there's a sense of freedom. Yeah. Even with like the last one we just did, just even freedom with movement and adapting and changing and growing and adjusting. And there, it, it almost becomes like you have more ownership each, each step of the way. And so I, I've loved that experience. I think it's also, isn't it, understanding the process behind making these films. And as I think everybody at Marvel, I think they, ha they take huge confidence with every new leap. Um, Kevin Feige has told me that, that the fact that people enjoyed the first Thor film gave him the confidence to dream Guardians of the Galaxy into existence. He thought, okay, people accept that superheroes are going to leave Earth and go into space. And, and then when Guardians worked, it was like he knew he could start cooking Infinity War. Um, I think so, as Marvel have grown in, in, in their extraordinary and unprecedented creative confidence, I think I felt more confident in their processes. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so easy to rewrite your own history. I remember being terrified making the first Avengers film because it wasn't a given that it was going to work. It, 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 was, it, it, was, um, it only worked based on how hard we worked to make it work, if that makes and sense. And everyone here, that's why it worked also. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The fans yeah. to continue to show up. Yeah. Um, I mean, we make we truly make these movies only thinking of fans, and that's what Kevin Feige cares about first and foremost. Yeah. Is he just wants to keep you guys on your toes, <laughs> yeah. and and entertain you and bring the stories that you love, and it's really truly always comes back to the fans. There's it's. It's yeah. the most amazing thing because I feel like sometimes some people get a little ahead of themselves and they think more about their ego. But if you can put what other people really want and love and desire at the, at the forefront of making something, 
then you do it with a lot of soul and a lot of care. Yeah. And that's what we've been trying to do specifically with the Marvel franchise, yeah. I think. It's also to do with your curiosity. And I think it ge it's given us the confidence to, I mean, what's amazing to me is that what, making the first Avengers, I, I asked Joss Whedon lots of questions. About, I, you know, who are these aliens and where have they come from? And um, what do they look like? What do they look like? <laughs> yeah. And uh, what's the deal that's been made? So Loki's been given this scepter by whom and for what purpose? And I think I was one of the first people to ask him that question. And he said, Thanos. So I go, who? Tell me about him. Uh, and, and then, you know, Kevin is on set and they tell me about Thanos. And I go, ah, so the, so so there's a thing in the Tesseract and there's one in the Scepter, okay. But I don't know at this point that, you know, Ultron is coming around and that there are going to be new characters based on what's inside Loki's Scepter. I mean, the thing is, after the Dark World, I went off on a sabbatical and I wasn't in the Marvel Universe for a while and I went to watch all the new films as they came out. And they was always talking about Loki's Scepter and I was like, ah, still... Still in there somewhere. <laughs> was only lovers left alive during that sabbatical? Yes. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Did you find a lot of comparisons or not at all? They're completely separate. I just, I just think the way they look, it just, I'm like, oh, there's Tom as the vampire and there's Tom. Or <laughs> I mean, apart from a, a long black wig, I think they're sort of, they deviate after that. Um, <laughs> But did that, did that worry you? That you created this bit. image well, of, a, of an iconic character that has paler skin and dark hair, and now you're making this really amazing Darmouche film that ends up being super, super special. Yeah. And getting to work with Tilda Swinton, who's also in our universe now. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I, yeah. I would be curious, like, are these different enough? J Jim was... Um was concerned about it in, in one way, but only because he'd written that film 10 years beforehand, yeah. before, before I'd played Loki. And he was quite careful to distinguish the two. Um, I mean, the, 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 the most consistent note that Jim Jarmusch gave me in that film was, you know, Tom, maybe smile less. Um, and because Loki smiles all the time because he's having a great time, he's the god of mischief, and Adam is, is, is heavy yeah. and in, interior and introverted and, and, um, and quiet. Um, but yeah, I was, I was aware when, when making it that they should be very different characters. And they feel like right. very different characters. They are different energetically. characters. I just think yeah. when you just look at them. Yeah. I was just curious if that was something that, because of the timing and the placement of when you did them. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just good. curious. I could have asked him that in private. So in the... <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the, in the comics, I don't know if... I don't know this, so I, I genuinely don't. How does Wanda become the Scarlet Witch? Wanda is the child of Magneto. Ah. Uh. But wow. so she was raised by a different family, right. so that she wasn't aware of her own, her own powers. Yeah. And then once she finds out that Magneto is her father, he tries to take her in, and that's how that begins. She's all, she was born a mutant. Right. Yeah. So she's not actually a witch. So, so Joss, because X-Men was not our property, yeah. Joss had to create a world, because Scarlet Witch does go in between the, the comic books, between X-Men and Avengers. Um, and so Joss was trying to create um, an origin story for Quicksilver and Scarlet mm. Witch that would be based in our world. Right. And so that's where it became the Hydra yeah. human experimentation because of anger from their family being bombed repeatedly in Sokovia. Yeah. But it also gives you so much, I think. Yeah, as opposed to just like I'm a mutant, like <laughs> yeah. which is which means a lot too. I'm not saying that, but yeah. but um, <laughs> I'm really not saying that. Um, but because um, th those movies are also beautiful in so many ways of of uh, how odd we all feel and and separate, and yet there's a home for all of us, and that's what I think is so beautiful yeah. about X Men. Um, 
But anyway, well, I don't remember what I was saying. <laughs> I'm really articulate. Um, what was I saying? I can't remember. You were talking about, you know, you just you answered the question. I did. Yeah. I answered my question. Yeah, you Great. did. Great. Next. Yeah. Um, Do you have another question? Should we ask the audience for questions? Yeah. Okay. How, well, how are we doing for time? Just quickly. Um, oh, no. One thing I, one oh, thing yes. I wanted to ask you. Yes. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen... Uh, Hang on. Stampede. Wisely and slow. They stumble that run fast. Um, has anyone seen Sorry I'm for trying. Your Loss? A couple of people, okay. It's very nice. Uh, Lizzie <laughs> is in a new series that's streaming on Facebook. Facebook. And it, it's called Sorry <laughs> for Your Loss. How many episodes? Ten episodes, 30 minutes. Ten episodes of 30 minutes. I'm, I've only seen the first two. Um, but it, it's essentially, well, how would you, you, how would you pitch it? I would say it's okay. about grief. It's, yeah, it's a story about a young widow, um, a newly, newly widowed woman who's dealing with the loss of her husband. And it's more of a reflection of the monotony and isolation okay. of grief, yeah. less than the dramatics. Because I feel like a lot of times we see grief and it's dramatized to a place that's almost unrelatable, or you can just put someone over there and you can judge them as an outsider, but we try and bring the audience in and put themselves in the situation that we all have to go through or have already gone through multiple times of what it means for your life to completely change with the loss of the most important person to you. And it's kind of a, it's a, it's a quieter reflection on that as opposed to throwing a lot of crazy turns. Uh, it's, Lizzie is amazing in it. It's really honest, authentic work. So if you can't, like, seek it out. I recommend it. Thank you, um, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> There's no yodeling in that one, sadly. Well, no. Maybe there is. Uh, um, should we take some questions? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hi, I love you both so much. Um, uh, Elizabeth, who could you say uh, you've gotten closest with on set? And who do you see you so yourself um, like being friends with 20 years from now? Um, that's a good question. I, it depends on what, which, which movie it was. Aaron's already a good close friend who played Quicksilver, mm -hmm. but he's gone. <laughs> So then I'm like, well, and then I end up making Gone, two. Gone, but not forgotten. Yeah, <laughs> not forgotten. You're still friends, though. Yeah, yeah, very close. And then Renner and I made a couple movies together, mm -hmm. Wind River, and, um, and he kind of became my surrogate brother in Captain America Civil War, so I got very close with him. And he, anoint, he anoints you as an Avenger. He does. <laughs> in, in Ultron. Yes. Yeah, it's like, yeah. if you go out there, you're an Avenger. Yeah, and, and they have you... this amazing continuation of like a big brother relationship. Yeah. And so I feel like I've worked with Renner, and also we were, the, we were the first ones to work on that in Italy, who's the only actor I worked with. I worked with him before I worked with Aaron. Um, and then Bettany, Paul Bettany, my vision. I just, I just love that guy so much. Um, and so yeah, that, that's, those are my answers about friendship. Um, <laughs> uh, is Tom, wait, uh, is Loki really dead? <laughs> <laughs> or is he still alive? <laughs> yes. Because he did go to the back for a little while. Say again? Is Loki really dead? No, he said you oh, I heard that back. bit. <laughs> you said he went to the back. Because he went to the back? Of the ship. Of the ship. Oh. And then came back. Oh, he went to the back of the ship, I see. Listen. <laughs> I've heard some amazing theories about this. Um, 
I was in a, a park in London a couple of weeks ago, and uh, some guys like come and say hi, and they asked me the same question, and they said, "Listen, they said, hey, listen, I don't know. We need an answer to this question. <laughs> All the other times, Loki's died. There have been a few. Um, he he stabs with his right hand, and now he's stabbing with his left hand." I was like, that was incredible attention to detail. Were you aware of that detail? What's that? Were you aware of that detail? No. <laughs> <laughs> Unintentional. <laughs> so, um, oh, dear. Um, I mean, uh, what's, what's your name, sir? Jacob. Jacob. Your guess is as good as mine. Um, hi, Mr. Henderson. I have a question for you. So as Loki is the god of mischief, and he's um, intelligent and charming, so what kind of student do you think he will be in high school? <laughs> Oh, I think he'd be really annoying as a high school student. <laughs> he'd sort of, he'd be um, throwing pencils at everybody else and, you know, probably finish his test 10 minutes early and sit there really smugly, you know, looking at everyone else going, oh, you're still going, you know. Um, uh, but I think, ultimately, I think he would have enjoyed it. I think he's, um, we used to... Uh, uh, Craig Kyle, who produced Thor and Thor The Dark World, used to, very early on, he, he would say to me and Chris Hemsworth that uh, the relationship between Thor and Loki was the quarterback and the artist. Um, and that, like, Thor as a kid was, you know, out there on, he was an athlete, he was physical, he was an outdoorsy, but, but Loki was always in the library reading or, you know, becoming a magician. So I reckon he would have liked high school a lot. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, Tom and Elizabeth, I love you both. Thank you so much for coming here. Congrats on your solo TV shows. But... Um, uh, how do you adjust this thing? Um, so my question is for Elizabeth. Yes. Um, since uh, Civil War era, uh, your character has been in a relationship with Vision, and it's really cute. Um, what's your favorite part about it, um, Scarlet and Scarlet Witches and Vision's relationship? My yeah. my favorite part mm -hmm. also has something to do with with. The, how their source of power that we were just talking about because the Vision and Scarlet Witch share the same origin of how, or parts of it. Um, and I think it's an amazing, it's an, it's an amazing metaphor for what it feels like to be like a kindred spirit with someone or to feel like you've known someone forever, that they actually literally have this thing that physically binds them forever. And so I think that's my favorite part of the relationship is it's this larger idea of when we find someone that we love so much and we feel like we've known them our whole lives. And that's, and that's what I love most about their relationship. Thank you. I have a question, I have a question about that. Um, here's what I wanted to know. The nightmare that Tony Stark has oh, in Oh boy, Ultron. that's gone back, yeah. Yeah. So you, you go around and you give everyone yeah, a nightmare. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what his nightmare is. It's the... It's it's the it's the the decimation That's of the what Avengers. I thought, yes. Yeah. So I wondered, is that connected to what happens in Infinity War? Is that did did Tony see it coming in his mind, and you connected him to that? I, I I don't know. I don't know if that's what could have happened if Ultron took over. I see. I'm not sure. Yeah. I think it's up to interpretation because I don't. It wasn't something that I remember someone was saying that we're going to go full circle to yeah. the Infinity War. Yeah. Um, there wasn't an Infinity War at that time. Um, but I think I always thought of it as it being what would happen 
if Ultron won. Yeah. But I think it's more interesting the way you're thinking about it. Well, maybe Tony's got the long view. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Good talk. Cool, High five. Great. <laughs> Good job. I don't know how to follow that up. Um, I'm Kaylee. Uh, first, I just want to say a quote from Tom, the sky's the limit, your sky, your limit, has just resonated with me. And I really appreciate that um, influence in life for adversity. But Elizabeth, I would like to know um, if you could tell your 22-year-old self, which is how old I am, <laughs> uh, what would you say? Just influence or any advice? Um, what would I say? God. Um to just really not sweat the small things that create an obscene amount of anxiety. And <laughs> anxiety is horrible. Um, and to know that you're enough the way you are. <laughs> um, hi. 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 Um, I am not good at English, so please understand. Especially, I am nervous. I'm very not good at English. Um, did, did Loki sit on the Grandmaster's chair in the Sakar? <laughs> Again, did Loki sit on the Grandmaster's chair? Yeah, yeah. The one, uh, Thor, Thor said, translate. Okay. You know, you know the one, um, you know the chair um, when Thor got to the Sakaar, the yes. same chair? Yes. Did Loki sit on the chair? No, he didn't. He says in the movie, he says, I didn't get a chair. Um, ah. Thor, Thor says, <laughs> when they see each other for the first time, this is in Ragnarok, um, Loki's sipping a Sakarian cocktail <laughs> um, and seems, it seems, his entry into Sakaar seems to have been remarkably smooth. And Thor says, where's your chair? And Loki says, I didn't get a chair. I don't know, I don't know why. Uh, at the um, first time? At, at what? the beginning. Huh? From the beginning? From the very beginning? And I think so, yeah. I think yeah. the, the way, we, the way uh, Taika saw it was that, um, shout out for Taika Waititi. <laughs> um, Taika, Taika said that uh, Loki gets beamed up to Sakaar, you know, three or four days before Thor does. And, you know, he's so smooth talking, he just kind of gets around the contest of champions, he doesn't have to fight. Um, he just gets in the elevator straight up to the top of the tree and <laughs> just has a really easy ride. I don't know why, but he does. So there we go. No chair. Hi, Tom. Uh, I'm Kashin from China. And uh, first of all, thank you for being here. And I love you both, especially you, Tom. And my question is... <laughs> I know. I know. You. Well aware. And, and my question is, uh, is there any chance for us to see Loki and Scarlet Witch fight each other or co cooperate with each other? I know there still remains a little hope in Marvel Cinematic Universe, because uh, uh, what about the... TV series that declare about these two char characters and... Well, I, this is the thing. When I was doing my homework about Wanda, I was like, that's so interesting that the scepter is the thing that makes Wanda Scarlet Witch. Yes. And when we were doing press for I Saw the Light, people would ask us who would win in a fight between Loki and Wanda. And I always said me. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> 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 but it made me think, like, I wonder who would. <laughs> but, but only be, Genuinely. because you probably would though because but, but, we have in the comics Loki wins at the front um, well I wipe out half a universe in the comics <laughs> but what's, what, I, so, what I find interesting Loki that I mean what's interesting is cause, because you've got all of the powers that the Mind Stone has given you yes but she notoriously has a hard time controlling them Ah. And emotion is her most powerful tool. I can't control your fear, only my own. 
Wow, Tom's quoting Scarlet Witch. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's really interesting. Sorry, I was just thinking about how it would be. But I, yeah, I don't think we're, I don't know if we're fighting anytime soon. My point is that, yes. that, that Scarlet Witch has one of the infinity stones almost as part of her being and Loki has only ever wielded an infinity stone. But he is a god. Hello, I'm Nika. My question is for both of you. Is there any movie or TV show moment that always makes you cry? I just want to say Bridget Jones's diary as a whole, but uh, I know there's something else. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> One moment. Hold, please. I'll get, I'll get there. I'm going to get there. <laughs> Should we come back to this one and let it percolate? It's a, re it's a really good question. And I could think of so, uh, so many, actually. Oh, Gone with the Wind. Oh, that's what Woo! it is. Sorry, it just came to me um, when he says, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And it's that, there's that part, but then there's the part where she loses the baby and, and she's pregnant, and I just can't handle that. I think I cry. And then there's another, when she decides I'll never go hungry again, there's that part. Um, <laughs> Gone with the Wind has me. <laughs> Um, but now, well, now I don't know. Now that I'm older, it's it's like when there's a um, like Paddington made me cry. Like I just lost it. Paddington made me cry as well, and Clay was, I was a like mess. Heaving sobs, yeah. Um, uh, uh, inside Out just wept. Toy Story. When when you, when when it's like you know there's this reconciliation of sadness and happiness and that those two things are part of life. Um, I think I cried when the new Star Wars came out, the first one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just because I was so excited for there to be Very another exciting. one that yeah. reminded me of the old movies. Lion, did you see Lion? Uh, with, with Deb Patel and um, Nicole Kidman, oof. Couldn't start to sort of pause it and have a break in that one, yeah. Yeah. Moana. Forget about it. The ending of Moana. You guys, I listen to that music while I exercise, and I'm not joking. It's on my playlist when I work out. Moana is the most powerful thing out there right now. Are you happy with that answer? Yeah. Cool. Can we take 20 minutes to answer the next one? <laughs> My name is Kaylee, and I love you both. Tom, your portrayal of Loki just it speaks to me so much. Um, and my question for you is, what is your take on, well, in Ragnarok, we kind of get to see Loki have a beginning of a redemption arc that kind of gets cut short in Infinity War, and I was just kind of wondering your thoughts on that. Well, the thing is that he, he is redeemed, and... Um, I found it very touching uh, because Loki as a character has been so broken uh, for so long. And you know, I, I think the center of him has been um, very fragile and very isolated uh, after those tra traumatic events in the first film when he finds out he was adopted, but not only he was adopted, that his parents or his father had left him to die. So he has internalized that shame of being abandoned and being alone. And, and then all of that shame is turned into uh, something harder and angrier, which is why he becomes the villain he becomes. He, be he comes down to earth, he tries to subjugate it. He becomes a villain in every sense of the word. He's motivated by hatred and anger, and then he loses his mother, and he's still kind of 
unself-aware in that way. And it's only the event, it's only losing his father who calls him one of his sons. Uh, Odin includes him, says, are my sons at the beginning of Ragnarok. And the chaos of another sibling, it, uh, you know, Hela turning up and, and Thor and Loki have to join forces and, and Thor really gets through to Loki in that way. And so to have it all come full circle and for Loki to call himself an Odin son, to really identify with that, to identify with the strength of his father's love before saving his brother, I found really touching. Thank you. Hi. Um, so this question is for both of you. If you and your character ever met, how do you think you would get along? That's so strange because I feel like I'm She's like I am a part of her, and she's a part of me. <laughs> so that's it's kind of a there's so much of your own like life experience that goes into creating characters, I think, and things that have nothing to do with you that are all make believe and that you are reaching towards. But um, it seems it's just it's a it's a hard question to answer. I would enroll Loki in a three year course of therapy. And, I missed uh, it. I missed the joke. <laughs> and, and I also asked him to teach me how to make duplicates of myself. It'd be so, I mean, honestly, it'd be so useful, wouldn't it? You could send your double to work, send your double out shopping, you know, get some groceries. So useful. Yeah. But I do think he'd be slightly disappointed, Loki, with me. He'd be like, so my representative on Earth has been you. <laughs> First of all, your hair is the wrong color. <laughs> Secondly, you're British. Dragon, dragon. I don't know where we got that from. Anyway, dragon. sorry, I'm messing around now. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Carol. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. And my question is about fan mail. Um, how often do you read your mail and how often do you respond? Because I haven't gotten a letter back yet. That, is that to me? Yeah. Oh, um, do you know what? I, I haven't written to you yet, Elizabeth. I'm sorry. I, um, I know. I read all I, of them. Okay. <laughs> I'll get to you. I promise. I try, I, do, I try and read as much as I can. Um, sometimes uh, it's, there's so much to go through that it's overwhelming, and there's also a lot going on in life, too. I'm so sorry that you haven't got... I mean, honestly, that's why I love coming to these events, because I actually get to meet everybody. Right. And um, it's a face-to-face -face connection as, a, as opposed to a remote one. I'm sorry that you haven't got it's anything a, back yet. It's been a okay. pleasure meeting you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, hi. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Huiyi, and uh, my question is for both of you. So, uh, as you mentioned, you've been together in I Saw the Light, like where you, both of you play characters that are very different from what you've done before, you know, like the accent and also a lot of singing, the music. Just wondering, how do you prepare for that role in the movie? Thank you. Oh, well, we well, Tom was put through the ringer preparing for that movie. It was, nice. it was really intense, yeah. Um, so I was not unaware that Hank Williams is a legend of American music. Um, and that it was my duty to represent the impact that he made on the cultural landscape. I mean, it really is profound um, that people like Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen and Keith Richards and Leonard Cohen and all the people who've almost make up our sense of what contemporary music has become, they all look to Hank as one of the first guys who was doing what they were doing. So um, I went to stay with Rodney Crowell, a musician in Nashville, Tennessee, um, who was amazing. And I stayed at his house for five weeks, and we just sang and played every single day. Um, 
it was, I found it very difficult because so much of Hank's uh, musical soul was kind of formed in him when he was a child. He was taught to play blues, um, and he'd been singing it and playing it since he was four or five, and I was trying to do what he'd done in 20 years, in five weeks. Um, so it was uh, an interesting time. But it was so much fun, though, to just be holed up in his house and singing and playing, and his little dog, Mono, was a good moral support. Um, yeah. And then when it came to making the film, I'd actually recorded half of the music bef uh, before we started, and then I did some of the songs live. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, my name is Avery, and I come all the way from Canada, Saskatchewan, which is very far. But my question is, like, what was your reaction when watching the scene where the Hulk was throwing you around? <laughs> you know, the, the most satisfying response I ever saw was um, Avengers was screened in late April of 2012 for an audience of um, first responders to the scene at 9 11. So these were like firefighters, police officers, people who worked in uh, medical services, ambulance workers, soldiers. And they, uh, at the end of the Tribeca Film Festival, Robert De Niro screened Avengers for these heroes. And I had forgotten that at the end of the film, there's like a battle for New York. And of course, like it's all Loki's fault. And um, the first responders screamed so loudly and jumped up in their seats and whooped and cheered. Um, that I couldn't actually hear the squealing that I had done in the movie on the floor. <laughs> and that's when I thought, I, I think the moment kind of works. Hi, uh, thank both of you for coming. My name is Irene. My friends and I came all the way from Houston, Texas to here. Um, my question is, uh, Tom, I saw you doing a lot of impressions of your co-stars in talk shows. And if both of you don't mind, can you do one for Elizabeth, if you don't mind? <laughs> I mean, I definitely don't mind. That's a Tom question. <laughs> I'd, I'd, be, I'd be curious to watch. <laughs> your impression of you, well, I didn't really do this. I'd be like, mm, that's my impression of myself. <laughs> like, <laughs> like mm, I don't know. <laughs> kind of, the thing is, I never meant to be, I'm not an impressionist. I really am not. I'm an actor. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing about the impressions is that it started to become something that people want to be expected more than the acting. So, so and I'm conscious that out there, they're quite divisive, these impressions. So I don't really do them anymore. Yeah. Oh, that, sorry. sorry about that. Um, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. So, and I couldn't do an impression of Lizzie. She's right here, so I yeah, couldn't do that. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks, though. Hello, Tom. My name is Emma. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you for being here. Not many people that I look up to come to Chicago. And I have been fascinating, fascinated with your work for such a long time. Coriolanus was fantastic. And what you said to me when I spoke to you during the autograph session when I wanted to ask you about acting, you made me feel valid, and I didn't know I needed that. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I will never forget it. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, oh, wow. Loud. Hi. Uh, I'm a little nervous. Um, I'm Ida, I'm from Turkey. Um, I quickly want to say you guys are amazing and my friend Audra wanted me to say hi to you, Elizabeth. She's incredible. And my question is, what is your favorite improvised scene that made it into the movie, any movie, from the, the ones you filmed? The Marvel movies? Yeah, the Marvel movies. I think anything that, anytime I've been in a scene with Mark Ruffalo, he's making everything up. 
He, except for the science part. The technical stuff, he just flubs all the time and he can't remember it. But uh, everything else, every time he has like a funny line or he's like tripping or he's a, like he's, he's making everything up as he goes and that, that gives me such joy all the time. Um, I think the, the one that's, that's kind of had its own life after the film is uh, Get Help. Oh my God. So that was amazing. That was we, just, we literally just came up with it on the day uh, as, as something which would, this idea that this is a trick that Thor and Loki used to, you know, they used to use it as a, as a game when they were kids and they stopped doing it a long time ago, but it used to work and it might just work this time. You know, they got one last ace up their sleeve. Um, and the idea that Loki hated it, he just was like, <laughs> I don't want to do it. It's humiliating. Um, and uh, Thor was like, you're going to love it. Come on. He's a big brother way. Um, and, uh, and then it works. Just it, in that moment, I always loved the fact it, it, it wasn't just a funny moment, but it actually, you understand something deeper about them as brothers. And, and I think those moments are, are kind of are really special. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for being um, here. I think we have time for, oh, we don't. We do have time for one more question. And then we'll be, yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. OK. <laughs> this is unexpected. OK. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. I'm Aaron. Uh, I'm going to ask the same question I asked with Chris and Lee and Karen, which um, really affected everybody when I said this. Uh, I had an anxiety attack last this week, well, actually last week, and it kind of affected me being up here and coming to the con, but for some apparent reason, I came, and I asked Chris about um, his anxiety and everybody around here just went bananas for me. And I was gonna ask the exact same thing. If you have anxiety, how do you, you I'm shaking right now. Um, how do you guys handle it? How do you um, handle? Wow, I got a whole list. <laughs> you, uh, that, that, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I had chronic panic attacks. I don't know what it was, 2011 or 12. So crossing the street was an issue. Anything that seemed like a mundane activity became an issue. And it's because your mind is spinning. It's because your mind, you, you're not controlling it. You're allowing all the, these thoughts to, to just circle. And it, it's poisonous, basically, to our, and you have actual sweaty palms and your heart races. I think I'm going to faint every time I stand on a stage in front of people. So I usually am holding on to someone during a Q&A. It's very, I, I totally get it. The only thing you can do is be present. The only thing you can do is say, uh, those are some brown shoes, those are blue jeans, that's a blue sweater, those are brown glasses. And you're, you stop your mind the moment you're able to do that. And that's literally just like a skill that the bigger picture is yeah. a much deeper one. And, and I think it's, it's based in fear and that's a sh shitty feeling. <laughs> Um, panic attacks and anxiety I think everyone really goes through at some point in their life and it's so normal and I think the best thing to say also is to tell someone I'm having a panic attack right now I'm just letting you know that in case something bad happens to me I need you to know that yeah. but usually nothing bad's going to happen because it's all in our, in our mind but I, I feel you yeah. and also I just say um, know that you're not alone and life isn't easy. It's not easy for anyone. And um, we all have moments of doubt and feeling destabilized and uh, uncertain. But actually, that's the case for everyone. And if we just hold each other in the uncertainty, then we'll get through it. So know that you're not alone. And we're all in it together. Thank you, guys. Okay. I love you, Tom. Thank you. Um, okay, guys. I think that's all we've got time for. Oh, thank you, moderator Tom. <laughs> Lizzie, it's, it's been, been a, a pleasure. It's been a pleasure spending Sunday afternoon with yeah, you. Yeah, thanks and very all much. Of you. Thank you to all of you. Thanks for having me. 
And um, I think there's also time in uh, Ace Universe tradition to take one huge picture with all of you. So everyone stand up and get in it.